He doesn't understand. It has nothing to do with not loving him. It just hurts. I'm afraid I'm going to lose him. I'm afraid he's going to find a younger woman who can't have sex. I'm worried all the time. I have panic attacks for no reason. Everything makes me anxious. I cry all the time. I can't stop crying. I can't control my emotions. I just don't know what's going on with my mom. I wish I could help. I just can't talk to her. Something's changed. I'm losing my mind. I feel like I have Alzheimer's. I can't remember anything. I really want to kill him. No, I really do. It scares me. I'm really worried about my mom. She just seems so sad all the time. I just don't understand my wife anymore. She says sex isn't important. It hurts when we have sex. It's like knives piercing my vagina. I just grit my teeth and hope that it ends soon. I don't like the way I look. I can't stand to see myself naked. I'm mad at everyone around me. Why can't everyone just leave me alone? Why can't he just stop bothering me? Why can't he just do it himself? Why does he think about it so much? I'm just not myself anymore. I know I'm here somewhere. I just can't find myself. Ever since we started taking Viagra, we've been having trouble in our marriage. I can't do it enough to satisfy him. The doctor fixed him, but, but I can't be fixed. Why are women, seriously now, not discussing this? Do you even know anything about menopause? No. I know you get, like, hot. And um, I, I think, like, some women, like, feel less feminine, maybe? Now, have you had women in your life who are going through menopause? Have you ever been with a woman who is going through menopause? No. Um, not that I was aware of, but and I don't think guys know a lot about menopause. If they come around me having that menopause, I can help that shit. I'm young. You see what I can do? I can help. I sing, ladies. You know, even watching my mom go through it, because I think that most girls kind of look at their mom to kind of see possibly but still, the moms aren't having conversations with their daughters about that either. My mom didn't tell me about my period. My mom didn't tell me about menopause until it was over. So I had to try to, like, go from the sidelines and watch her symptoms and see if she got kind of crazy and, like, take notes, so to speak. A lot of women don't realize that they think that it's just, oh, you know, OK, my period stops. And they only really focus on the fact that their period has stopped. And it's really so much more than that. Uh, believe it or not, I didn't know what was happening to me. I was 50, uh, no, I was 48. And in my head, menopause was something that took place in your middle 50s and closer to 60. It never occurred to me what, what, what was really going on. <laughs> And uh, what a rude awakening. I say menopause to you. What do you say? I it's right off the top of your head, Keith. Cougar. I say menopause. Cougar. Cougar. <laughs> That's oh what my I God, said. what an asshole. No, no, seriously. It's like the cougar, the cougar. That, hot that's flash. Annoying. All right, hot flash. Hot is that a more flash. acceptable answer? They're both annoying, actually. They're both that's what I. Mad. That's what I. You're asking a guy who offends me what he thinks about menopause. Like I have anything to add. It's funny because we we know it's coming, but 
we don't prepare for it. What are some of the signs of dry vagina? Because I knew when it was happening to me because I sat in the bathtub and all the water went whoosh. So I knew something has changed yet. You're going through menopause right now? Yes, yes. Can I ask you how old you are? I just Give turned 50 grade. on May 20th. Really? Yes. Look at you. It's a nightmare. And you, you're dripping, you're sweating. You're you want to like kill spit. people? Well. You're it's, spitting? It's, uh, I love that. It's terrible. And I usually walk around with these little ice packs that I bought at Marshall's. Yeah. And you like you put the ice in and you sit here and you put it here and you get so wet. And my sheets, when I wake up in the morning, I'm like soaked. It feels like, what the hell's wrong with all these people? I'm hot. I would be in, like, in the middle of winter with one sleeve off everywhere I went, just walking through a blizzard with one sleeve off, just walking around asking people, it doesn't feel like it should be hot out here. I'm, I, my name is Lynn Coplet, and I'm a comic. I live in New York City. If you're all wondering what I have to do with this and how I could fit in, we're wondering that too, because <laughs> I'm a work in progress. I'm a New Yorker now, but I'm still a Southerner. I'll, I'll, I'll cut you in the face, but I'll pray for you. I was relieved when I got finished with, with all of it. When I went through menopause and I didn't have the monthly goddamn everything, and then, uh, you know, then in menopause, all the cra and then when I was past it, I was like, oh, thank God that's over. I am on a mission to save menopausal vaginas in America. Well, then sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. At about age 17, I thought I was pregnant. And I went to my doctor who confirmed that I was. I was devastated. And I remember telling the nurse in the office that this was going to ruin my chances of going to medical school. I really didn't know what to do. I was in that situation that so many girls find themselves in. And I decided that the only option for me was to have an abortion. And I was devastated by that. I scheduled an appointment at a clinic and I went and I had the most wonderful physician take care of me there. He was gentle and calm and reassuring and listened to everything that I said and why I didn't have another decision to make besides this one. He examined me and said, I really don't think you're pregnant. And we did another test, and it was negative. I burst into tears, and I was so overwhelmed and thankful. And he and his nurse took the time to walk me to my car and help me get through this. And I told him then that I wanted to be an OBGYN just like him, and I wanted to help young girls as he had helped me. The first thing I thought of was getting back to my other doctor who had told me that I was pregnant. They brought me into the examination room and I couldn't, I couldn't wait to tell him my news. And he came in and I said, I'm not pregnant. And he said, I know, I was trying to teach you a lesson. It was, so intensely cruel that I can't put it in words. I wanted to kill myself. I thought about killing a baby. And I got up and I told him, I'm gonna be an OBGYN. I'm gonna go to medical school. I am gonna become a doctor and take care of women, but I'm gonna come back to Savannah and I'm gonna save the women of Savannah from you because you can't treat someone like that. So 
I came to Savannah and I practiced for 15 years. After 15 years, I was thrown into a new practice in my own office. I went from taking care of 20 to 40 year olds to taking care of 40 to 80 year olds. Overnight, I had to learn a whole new way of doing medicine. Every day women came in with problems with menopause. They're begging for help with sleep, with hot flashes, and mainly with intimacy problems. They have realized that over the past 10 to 15 years of their lives, from 50 to 65, that they have let go their marriage. They have lost that drive and intimacy and the, I can't wait to get up and see you in the morning. The children have left now and they're alone with their husbands and they don't even know this person. I am so excited about our next guest. She's been on before many times. She was uh, recommended by Arlene Coplitz. She's my friend. She's gynecologist to many and now she's on a mission to educate women about menopause and everything that has to do pretty much with the vagina. She's my gyno now. I just filled out my paperwork. So has she seen your vagina? Not yet. She's going to possibly today after the show. All right. Well, then let's welcome Dr. Pamela D. Dr. Come on in, Dr. Pamela D. Hello, beautiful. Oh, how cute she is. Is she cute? Oh, I mean, you look adorable. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. So can you break down like what happens in uh, like pre-menopause? Because I might be there. You know, I think what you need to think about is around age 40, you go through puberty in reverse. What do we talk about young girls going through puberty? They're slamming doors, they're crying for no reason, they are angry, they have no rationale for anything, and then you can't watch Hallmark commercials or that <laughs> dog. Commercial without sobbing. It's so true. I was watching something the other day. I was crying last night at The Voice. But how old are you then? 47. 47. So you're kind of like right in the heat. No, Dr. Pam says, I'm going I'm going through it right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is, is, how long is menopause? Well, say the perimenopausal, what we call transition, is from 40 till whenever you stop having periods. The actual definition of menopause is no periods for 12 straight months and then after that you're always going to be menopausal See, for me i don't have them for three for three months sometimes so you can so you can go, go on and on for 10 years like this oh yeah yeah well how did your menopause go i didn't even know i went through it and then one day i was holding an egg and i realized i had hard boiled it so i had one hot flash one I was very lucky, very lucky. But I think the biggest problem, I know you're talking about physical problems, which is so important. Mentally, I think what it does to a woman is horrible. And I think it's nature's rotten trick. That's why when they say, God may be a woman, no way. No. No, God is definitely a man, because no woman would do this to another woman. When men are emotional, you're like hurricanes. You can track it. You know that's been the case with your father, your husband. When you, when you were a kid, you touched something that your daddy told you not to touch, and your mother would say to you, oh, when he gets home, we're going to have a problem. Everybody take your places. You prepared for it. When we are emotional, when my mother was emotional, we, we are like tornadoes. You can't track a tornado. You don't know when it's coming. You ever been in a twister? You're just sitting on the front porch enjoying the day, and all of a sudden, shit don't feel right. The <laughs> whole climate changes. You see it coming in the distance. Run, it's coming. Because what men don't understand and what we don't understand is that it's been up there brewing for a long time. And something usually just triggers it, some small thing. Like, who left the sock in the middle of the living room floor? What do you mean you don't know? How can you not know? Only four people live here. 
two are small, one is me, one is you, and I don't leave big stinking socks in the middle of the living room floor. I don't even go in the living room because I want one nice room. That's why. One nice room where I can take the preacher or the president or somebody that might, somebody might visit me. You don't know that they won't. Don't walk away from me. And you think we're crazy? You know what I think's crazy? I think someone who goes out to a level five twister and screams, you need to calm down. I promise you, if you let us twist, it dissipates, doesn't it? It just, we start to realize, this is crazy. And off it goes, and out comes a rainbow. Who wants cake? <laughs> Why does everyone look upset? <laughs> Your poor husband's in the bathtub with the children. Put the mattress back on the bed. Don't look at your mama, boy. Just go. <laughs> Owens Group did a survey of the medical schools and the residency programs in the United States and Canada. 80% of the programs had no menopause education for their residents. 80%, zero. And there's 60 million women in menopause just in the United States. Mm -hmm. And nobody, 80% of our graduates are not being trained about any of it. That's correct. All women are going to go through menopause unless they die before they get there. Not everybody has a baby. So there are more people probably who have to deal with menopause than deal with childbirth. Yet we don't teach anything about menopause to this cohort of folks taking care of women, which is scary. It's very scary. How much menopausal training did you get in your residency? Not enough. The truth can be said for a lot of us is that you don't get that until you're sitting there in your office after you've been out for a few months, not even long, <laughs> just a few months, and you have this woman in front of you who comes and she says, okay, doctor, you know, I'm, I'm having issues in the bedroom, things are painful, or my libido's gone down, or something has happened in this area of my life, and then you're trying to figure out, okay, I don't remember this. We didn't, we didn't have this right. before, and you don't have anything to, to draw from. So you really have to kind of build that trust training, I think, post-residency. If fertilization of the egg does not occur, the egg dissolves or disappears. When this happens, the blood in the wall lining of the uterus is not needed and is discharged from the body. This is called menstruation. It happens every time an unfertilized egg dissolves away. That is, uh, about every 28 days. When we're in elementary school, they give us health lectures mm -hmm. on puberty and what to expect. And then when we get into high school, we get the, be careful, you're going to get a sexually transmitted sure. disease talk. Sure. Nowhere in there do we talk about. And then after your ovaries are old, you're going to go through menopause and what that shows. Yeah. And unbelievably, we don't talk about it in medical school. We don't talk about it in residencies. Yeah. Yeah. So the new doctors going out that are going to be gynecologists have very little training in menopause. In the year 1900, the average age of women reaching menopause in the United States was 48, which was also the average life expectancy. Fast forward over 115 years later, and the average lifespan of a woman is now 80 years, with most women hitting menopause at age 51. The majority of women now spend more than one third of their lives postmenopausal. Though they can no longer have children, there is no reason any postmenopausal woman should suffer from a lack of intimacy. I always ask people, you know, are they feeling any complaints related to vaginal dryness? And they'll say, well, you know, I'm not sexually active. And I'll say, yeah, but you have a bladder. <laughs> and they'll say, oh, yeah. You don't have to be sexually active to be having discomfort related to vulvovaginal dryness. Right. Even the outside right. organs can get very, very dry, crack, yep. and shrink up yep. and scar. Yep. My latest joke is my vagina is so dry, Peter O'Toole drove a camel through it. And I, <laughs> you know, so. 
Hello and welcome to Health Talk. I'm Ashley Dvorkin, in for Dr. Manny. Listen up, ladies. Are you between the ages of 30 and 50? The and nightly not news like yourself, about ladies? 10 years ago scared, actually 15 years ago now, scared women out of their minds with estrogen causes breast cancer. And 80% of women just cold turkey stop their estrogen. Do you know how many female OBGYNs stop their estrogen? 8%. That we're we're comfortable and our patients are uncomfortable, but the women are so scared. It's hard in a 20 minute exam to explain that it, it's not as bad as you think and it may help your quality of life and your relationship tremendously. Do you take it in your menopausal state or pre-menopause? I start it when people are having hot flashes and night flashes. So then I might be eligible right now. The indication for hormone replacement therapy is symptoms, not blood levels. Oh. Okay, if you're having symptoms and I can fix it with some estrogen and you are willing to take those risks, take them. Quality of life is everything to me. I don't care if my life's shorter, just as long as it's fun. And I feel good. You don't know how many people come in and say this. I'll start talking about the risk. Well, I have to talk to you about this. And they're like, stop it. I don't care what happens to me. If I die tomorrow, I got to get rid. I can't sleep. I want the drug. Right. So they have gotten to a point, but they didn't have to get to that point. Do you take estrogen then for the rest of your life? Well, we want you to take it for the shortest amount of time that you need it. So the lowest dose at the shortest period of time. The one thing I don't want them to come off of, though, is the vaginal estrogen. Okay, because that helps with dryness and everything. Yes. And the systemic estrogen that you take through your skin is mainly for your symptoms of hot flashes and the mood swings that come <laughs> you know, an up wall thing. But I need women to protect their vaginas from the time they're going in the perimenopausal transition to the time they die. I want estrogen in the vagina when they are going in the ground. I do. So where is their gynecologist to say, surely you're in trouble here? <laughs> you can. You can look at somebody's vagina and pretty much tell their age. Really? Like a tree. Yes. The, you can count the rings. <laughs> that is horrifying, Dr. Pam. I know. I think it's great. That someone could just look at a badge lineup like, and know. <laughs> you know, all your friends that lie to you, you get them drunk and you take a look. I don't think you are 42, Shirley. In the Women's Health Initiative study that was published initially about a dozen years ago, that indeed the thing that got every woman nervous was, oh my goodness, this is going to increase my chance of getting breast cancer. That's what the major anxiety was. But what you need to realize, it was really only the estrogen plus progestin arm of the WHI after many years, after over five years, that showed a slight increased risk of breast cancer. What's sort of scary and unfortunate is what most women in this country still don't realize is in the Women's Health Initiative, part two, which was published in 2004, the results, initial results were published, and the women using estrogen only, okay, that there was actually after seven years that there was no increased risk of breast cancer. Now, let's go to vaginal therapy. First of all, vaginal therapy is estrogen only, <laughs> okay? So there is no progestin in vaginal therapy. The other thing that's so important for women to realize is that the amount of estrogen that gets absorbed through the vagina is minuscule. I'm not gonna tell you it's nothing, you know, okay? It is there, but it's a tiny amount of Your absorption. Vagina loves that local estrogen. Your vagina loves the estrogen. Oh, it's sucking it in. It is. It's thickening it and lubricating it, and it's making everything work again. I want your vagina to stay like an accordion. I want those folds so that when you're ready to stretch it out, it stretches out. But if you don't do something, mm -hmm. your accordion goes away, and you just have a piece of PVC pipe. Oh, that's true, Pam. It doesn't move. The one place we want to have wrinkles, we lose our wrinkles. <laughs> Everyone sing, everyone sing, everyone sing.
What do you know about menopause? Uh, not that much. That's like when uh, the women stop producing their eggs. <laughs> I like that because that was such a farmer's answer. Yeah. Do you know the symptoms of menopause? No. I, I assume they get really angry. I kind of dreaded it because a lot of my friends were talking about the hot flashes and how angry they were. I have a younger sister who went through menopause. She's still going through it now. And she told me that she was afraid because she, she wanted to kill people. Yeah. You know, with women, it's a little bit more steady. Like, you know that once they go through menopause, their estrogen levels are going to drop. and that there are physical effects to the estrogen dropping. Men and men's functioning does also decline with age. That's a natural part of how it works. You'd see the men and women sort of declining together, right? Well, that used to happen. Everybody faded out around age 60. Mm -hmm. But then in 2001, Viagra came out. Fever! Talk to your doctor about Viagra, America's most prescribed treatment for erectile dysfunction. Learn more at Viagra.com. Ask your doctor if your heart is healthy enough for sex. So what happened is now men could have penetrative sex when their female partners could no longer tolerate having as much penetrative sex unless they were taking, you know, systemic or local hormones to help them with that. I see marriages every day ending over lack of communication about sex. I keep going back to women when they tell me, well, you know, it's easy for my husband, he just takes a pill. And I tell them, yes, but you make your husband your lover. A pill can't. It only makes him hard. Right. The pill will make him hard, but you turn him into an excellent lover or a bad one. And you turn them into that by the way you talk to him during love, the, the way you know your body and can guide him to be successful at helping you orgasm. Because you're after that orgasm. You're after that because it's so healthy. And I think, I think the whole idea of connecting and sharing that euphoria of an orgasm is, there's just nothing like that. Right. right. I'm in Woodland Hills, California with the Craig Shoemaker, one of my favorite comedians of all time. I'm the love master, baby. Yeah. Yeah, I'm as hard as Final Jeopardy. That's right, baby. Yeah. Oh, I will love you so good your neighbor will have a smoke. That's right, baby. I hope that's a wide-angle lens you have there. Oh, yeah, pack it up. I'm so big, I make flesh-eating bacteria gay. <laughs> now, speaking of large penises, I, I knew nothing about Viagra. I went to the pharmacist to investigate. I said to him, can I get it over the counter? He goes, yeah, if you take two or three. But I would not get Viagra, and I'm going to tell you why. Or Levitra or Cialis. The side effects, it takes up half the commercial. You ever see the side effects? Could cause itching, swelling, loss of hearing, pneumonia, vomiting, diarrhea. Whoa, slow down. Loss of hearing? Is it really worth the risk? One night of good sex you can't hear anymore? She's yelling your name. You're like, huh? Who? <laughs> you want me to caddy? But everything has risk. Everything has risk. Every you, you know, you, you pick up the New York Times on Tuesday, and they say, don't drink coffee. You pick up the New York Times on Friday and it says, coffee's great for you. I mean, I, I have reached the point now where I just live on Cheetos. That's right. Because we know Botox is bad, but what do we say to that? Oh, too fucking bad. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, what we say is, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you don't see the FDA saying, you should concentrate more on intimacy. You should concentrate more on uh, being together and making plans with one another and listening to one. No, they're not saying that. They're saying, here's your problem, here's your fix, and it's going to cost you money. Did you see 
any increase in the problems in women when the medications for erectile dysfunction came out? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's really important to recognize right. that, um, you know, I call it, you know, the Viagra effect or, you know, the PD-5 inhibitor effect. You know, a man takes the medication that he's received on the doorknob when he says, oh, by the way, right. he hasn't gotten an appropriate evaluation. He goes out and mows the lawn for an hour, comes back and says, I'm ready. And she says, ready for what? You know, because the paradigm has shifted. And I think it's very important to recognize. And there's really great information now coming out and shows if you treat the man and have effectively treated the woman, they both increase in terms of overall sexual satisfaction. So for the first time, after 16 years of erectile dysfunction drugs and helping the men out there, we finally have these three drugs, Brisdel to help hot flashes, Osfina to help vaginal dryness, and the Duovi to help hot flashes and to stop osteoporosis. That's great. I mean, it's about time. <laughs> Why did it take so long? It, you know, we are, we are just, you know, we at NAMS couldn't believe that in one year we really had a, three new agents approved for midlife women's health. It really was very exciting. I think part of it is that the FDA, you know, have a very high bar for safety for what I would say are, are lifestyle or symptom drugs. So you know, if you are approving a drug to treat cancer or congestive heart failure, you're willing to accept a relatively high bar for safety versus risk. But when you're treating something like hot flashes or vaginal dryness, although it bothers us, it's certainly understandable that the bar for safety should be high. And I think that's what's happening with the sexual dysfunction drugs as well. As much as we'd like to see these drugs approved relatively easily, you need a high bar for safety when you are using a drug for, at the end of the day, something that is not life-threatening, even though it's incredibly mm -hmm. important. So do you remember your mother's menopause? Uh, I do, but it was actually a forced menopause because she got cancer, so. So, right. My, through my the mom, treatment. My mom had the hysterectomy and she had the forced menopause too, but no. So all of a sudden yeah. she was sweating out of nowhere. Like, the hot flashes. Yeah, not exactly. something I look forward to. Yeah. And I'm at the age now. 47 that my mother was when we thought my mother had lost her mind <laughs> the great cold cut fiasco of 85 when we found her in the kitchen throwing luncheon meat at the dog and screaming i'm just a sandwich maker to you people nobody cares about me this i can't have nice things nobody gives a crap if i die here and we were all like, what the heck is wrong with mom? She's lost her mind. Now I look back and I think she's, she was completely justified. She was right. We did not care. I remember eating that meat. <laughs> I, I will tell you there are some drawbacks I've decided to having a, gyne a gynecologist. What do you call yourself? A gynec a gynecologist, a gynecologist friend, and that is, um, we are on our way to dinner last night, and very casually she said something. I don't even know how we got on this subject, but Dr. Pam says to me, well, and then your vagina could fall out. And I was like, what the hell did you just say to me? And she's, <laughs> I'm already deeply wounded at some of the other things she said when she was in New York. Yeah, she tells you if you don't use it, you lose it, which is why I've got my car keys up there right now. I don't even bring a purse with me anymore. Not because I want to use it with anybody. I just don't want to lose it. I feel like... <laughs> and now it'll drop out. I said, oh my goodness, that's a horrible note to leave for housekeeping. <laughs> If you find this, it's mine, and I definitely need it back. So what is the answer? Well, you have to use it or you lose it. Well, then I must have lost it 10 years ago. <laughs> Women come in and I say, well, how often are you having sex? Well, my anniversary. You know, once a year or on his birthday and your anniversary is not enough. You have got to keep using it. And I recommend moisturizers, 
and they're great moisturizers, but how do women go pick out a lubricant in the public? Yeah, and how do you, and you, what are you going to you know, ask they, the, the, the druggist? It's very embarrassing. Humiliating. 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 And if you do grab a lubricant in the grocery store, you grab it, you throw it in the thing, and you rush down to the toilet paper so that nobody really sees you throw it in there. And yes. you hope the little girl doesn't go, you know, price check on. I, I was going to say, price check on Vagisil. <laughs> <laughs> it's my cousin. I describe it as almost like a zipper closing from the top right. down. And a lot of women don't realize that that is what's occurring. Like I say, so as you, you know, as you get older, you may not, you still may be active. You just may not be as active as you previously were for right. whatever reason. But that thinning of the tissue is causing the two edges to physically stick together. And then if I do meet somebody or I do decide to be active, the physical act is literally forcing that tissue open. Right. And that's when you end up with more pain, right. hemorrhaging, bleeding, which is not exactly how you want that particular act to go. Right. When the menses begin to wane, the change is emerging. And they just think it's all over. No, sweetie, it's just begun. It's just begun. You've only just begun. The best part of your life. Mm. And it can be the most intimate part of right. your life. And the most sensual, honey. But you got to work it out. Yeah. You got to protect it. Yes. You got to keep it How do you, how do you think they got to protect it? They need to moisturize it on a regular basis. They need to keep the blood flow to it. The best way to do that is to have intercourse. Now, we're not going to have intercourse every day. But you can use a vibrator every day. You can get the blood flowing in there. You can keep it stretched out. This is an organ that if you don't use it, you lose it. It shrinks in length, it shrinks in diameter. It kind of like a, 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 a raisin. Yes. Vibration was originally thought of as a superior treatment for hysteria. Now that's not a, a disease that you would diagnose a patient with today, but within the lifetime of many women and men in America, people had been diagnosed this way. And when the vibrator came along, it simply carried on a practice that some doctors had been doing for centuries, even millennia. The great Greek physician Galen, before the common era, before the, the Christian era, was suggesting that hand massage of the vulva and clitoris would give hysterical women relief, hysterical paroxysms of relief, which is a Saturday night name for an orgasm. Right. But that's not how it was discussed by most women, their partners, their doctors, throughout time till fairly recently. So when we say that orgasms relieve stress, doctors from centuries ago knew that. They absolutely knew that. I'm not sure they knew why that was the case, but they could see it. And they could tell that um, whether it was in a partner sex context or whether it was done by hand by a physician, that this natural response, we think of it as, as something that's, that's sort of emotional and, and special. And it is, of course, especially given the context, but it's also a reflex. And it's a reflex from a certain kind of stimulation. Introducing vibrators into your practice. What what do you say? And I live in a relatively conservative area of the country, so I introduced the idea acknowledging that there may be a level of discomfort for my patient right. and understanding that I don't know her religious beliefs, her cultural backgrounds, her partner's understanding of this. So I tell them that as a clinician, I want them to know that we feel there are direct benefits to them when they hear about blood supply and nerve stimulation and how it can benefit arousal. I, I think it becomes so much more acceptable. Physical and therapy for your vagina. Totally. And then I show them some of the products that are now out there. They're really nicely designed and great um, materials being used in them. So I think that that's become significantly improved in being able to have a great conversation around that.
The patient will many times go, oh no, oh no, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to, I don't want to see it. And then I'll bring it out and turn it on. And I just put it on their lap. <laughs> oh, and I get, oh, I see. It's very nice. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. But properly placed on the button. Ooh. And then you can go in the middle here, hold on to the end there. Okay. Pretend that's your vagina. And we can, it has like 10 modes. Oh God, I could tell my friends about this. Yes, you can. And that's through your clothes. Can you imagine how nice it would be if it was not through your clothes? <laughs> so let's talk about the stigma of using this. You know, it, there's no stigma at all for None. men to use Viagra. None. We, it's on erectile dysfunction, it's on the television, every other commercial. We just take it for granted now that it's a problem and they fix it. But there's a stigma, a double standard that we can't really talk about these products or we're dirty or we're bad. Not at all. What do you feel about that? There shouldn't be a stigma. You know, we have partners. Being sexually well is part of the equation. So if men have Viagra, a woman needs to have a little bit of help as well. Do you I like toys? Whole, I do. They're wonderful. <laughs> I love toys. They are wonderful. <laughs> toys are good. They are. They do. They make and it. They, they, you change it up. It's fun. It's more interesting. And this is from Lalo. I have Lalo. Oh, God, I, do, I do. I do. I think I have Lalo. a whole. I have a whole stash in my drawer next to my bed. <laughs> And sometimes, one time, actually, my housekeeper, it was, I didn't realize the thing was, she was like looking around, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, my that's thing my was going. That's my razor. I don't know why my razor's going off like, right what now. what is that sound, man? What's been going on in that drawer? Oh, boy. Have you seen them? I like these because they, they don't, they're not intimidating looking. But notice the, t the, the curves. The colors are, are delightful. But this one is uh, meant to go, it, it actually goes up inside you. Oh. And it comes with a remote control. Okay. And here, hold on to it. See how it's Ooh. moving around like that? <laughs> that's right. really moving. Yeah, that's what it does. I really know in there. And you, you, <laughs> I mean, it's really moving. Yeah, yeah it's really moving. That's what helps In all out. directions. I know. <laughs> Imagine that. If you could find a penis that could do that. I have vibrators that I have them use that look just like stick shifts. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then the guy gets two for one. They get their car, mm -hmm. some you, horsepower. And let me tell you, they have buttons on them so you can pretend it's a remote too. <laughs> That's great. Millions of women will go to a pure romance party in just this year alone. And to be able to help them to make decisions on what's gonna happen in their bedroom, to be able to give them permission to understand their bodies better and to be able to communicate with their healthcare providers. Why would I change my journey? I love what I do. You have great products, vaginal dilators, great lubricants. The vibrators are amazing. I don't think women should die without using a vibrator. Ex at least having that experience, you know, and. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that they're wonderful tools. It gets the blood flowing, number one, which we know as we age, we hit those menopausal years, we need to really work on that. Because, you know, I hear women say, oh, I don't need that. You know, I mean, come on, Patty. I, you know, every time I hit a stoplight, my doctor told me, you know, to kegel 10 times. That's crazy. You know what, I want you, I want you to go home. I want you to take this product and if it doesn't work, I'll give you your money back. Right. And you know what? These women come back and go, oh, you know what? I started using that. I've been using it for a month. And he says, it's like being with a new woman. I have a lady who says she can crack a walnut. <laughs> I believe it. Well, you know, women question, why am I peeing a little bit when I sneeze? Mm -hmm. Or when I laugh too hard? Or when I do this or I do that? This is why, because one in three women are incontinent yes. and they don't know it. So no if idea. they had more tissue and more muscle strength there, we could hold that urine in. Yes. But we got to work those muscles. You have to work the muscle. Women go to the gym every single day. They work out the muscles in their body, but that's the pelvic floor muscle is the one that's the most neglected. I am so excited about Intamina's new product, 
the Kegel Smart. It's going to completely revolutionize the way women do their Kegel exercises. It works by biofeedback, and all you have to do is turn it on, you insert it, it will prompt you when mm -hmm. to squeeze and when to relax. And when you squeeze, it actually records the level or the strength of your squeeze or your contraction, and it registers you on an initial level of one through five. So it's like going to the gym and working out. You're gonna start with a lower weight and work yourself up gradually. So we want all these women out there on level fives. We want everyone to get to a level five. My wife does that. She does Kegel exercises. Yes. And I see her, I see her doing them and I, I want to help. Do <laughs> you need a spotter? <laughs> I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do in being in support of the Kegels, but I'm enjoying that she does them. And she's very strict about it. It's like going to yoga class for her. I am here at Tybee Island with Lael Harrelson from Colorado Springs, Colorado. You created a website. I did. CovenantSpice.com. Yes. Covenant Spice is for, you know, it's a marriage covenant. You agree to be faithful to each other and to only be with each other. And I wanted to, people to have the opportunity to add spice to that. So that's where the, the name came from. You had a different upbringing religiously than most of us. Well, I was raised Mennonite. And it's a beautiful religion, but it's about as conservative as you can get. And so um, they have a little different theology when it comes to romance when you're growing up. And that is that Adam didn't go seeking a wife. God put him to sleep and woke him up when he had a wife for him. And that we should put that part of our life to sleep until God brings us a spouse. When I met my husband and um, we got married, I couldn't wake that part of my life up. We'd been asleep so long. You had never had an orgasm before? No. I had never held hands or kissed anybody before. What did he do to help? He had to have helped. He did. He actually went to a sex toy shop one time. He took me with him. How was that experience? It was horrible. I just wanted to get out as fast as I could and have, I didn't want anything to do with um, the products or that place. And um, I just felt defiled. But he did buy a toy. He did. And it worked. Yes. So I was laying in bed with my husband one night and I told him, you know, it'd be so cool if some Christian would make a site that sold all of these marital aids or intimacy aids without any connection to porn. Like a husband and wife could just go and shop there together and be each other's star, you know, nothing right. else detracting from that. And then it hit me, I could do that. And you did. I did. There's links to, if you have questions, for example, about what which toys are good with menopause or what products, you know, or is the Bible really okay with this? Or, you know, there's links to questions like that. And that's the part that really makes my- uh, Different. Different, yeah, is just those, it's from, a you know, answering questions from a biblical standpoint. God created our bodies for pleasure. He's the one that designed us the way we are. He's the one that said, you're not even allowed to withhold yourselves from each other. You know, I mean, you're supposed to be, uh, it's an important part of your marriage. The greatest communication that we have with another person would be sexual intercourse. That's the, the most intimate. And, and the relationships we have, the intimates that we have, the sexuality we have, that's part of who we are as human beings. And, and God claimed that as, as good at the creation. I want these couples to get the romance back into their marriages. I want them to relearn each other and grow in the second half of their lives. Right. It really does take work, but I think that uh, long-term marriages can have a depth to them that uh, new marriages will never understand. The greatest gift that a father can give to his children is to love their mother. And that's always stuck with me uh, but, but paying attention to one another. And over the years, you become so comfortable that you do become one. And hopefully, uh, the relationship that you would have, you'd be able to discuss anything, and you'd be able to share anything. And, and uh, 
I think that that is the kind of marriage that, that God would want us to have. When I tell an older woman right. to get a vibrator just right. for the blood flow, right. a grandmother. <laughs> I can't do that. Like, yes, you can. Yes. It's physical therapy right. for your vagina. Mm -hmm. I want to get the pornography connotation yes. off these. Yes. And sometimes it just means we have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some work, yes. but it's worth it. Definitely. And, and it's OK. It's not, it's not a negative thing to say this matters, and I need to find out what I can do medically whether it, and also lubricants, different things people can use to make things comfortable and pleasant and joyful again. You know, it's funny how socially acceptable Viagra is yes, now. And yes. to talk about this, it's all over the television. Yes, yes. But there's no, no. quid pro quo. Yeah, kind of a double standard, really, yes. yeah. We need to understand there's no shame in, in feeling good. There's no shame in healthing having all of your body parts being healthy, even the vaginal area. And I think, I, I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, that women, when they're unliberated, you know, we're afraid to even talk about those particular areas of their life, their sex life, their romantic life, and, and that type of thing. And I think uh, with, the, with the revolution of, of humanity, both men and women having this, this kind of revolution and changing, uh, it's a good area that you're exploring. And I would say, as a spiritual director, that there's nothing wrong with them exploring that area. There's nothing wrong with them uh, being liberated in that area. There's nothing wrong with them um, uh, having pleasure, right. you know. Judaism traditionally has been very open in regard to sexuality, the beauty of it, the blessing of it. For example, uh, on the Sabbath, we are, we're not supposed to create anything uh, so that there are strict rules, especially in Orthodox Judaism, about the things you can do that are work. Well, one of the things that you are allowed to create is you're allowed to have sex on the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, it's considered to be a great mitzvah commandment, something that is a blessing to you. So that's really the very basis of the attitude towards sexuality. Also, there's an understanding and tradition that a uh, husband has an obligation to please his wife and that if the husband is not, she actually has the right to um, comment on it and point out that it is expected that it is, and it is required that she be pleased in the relationship. I've, I, I believe, we believe that, uh, that intimacy is between husband and wife within the context of marriage. When Sherry and I are intimate with each other, if we're looking to meet the other person's needs instead of our own, both partners get their meet needs met. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think you can point people to scripture because the Book of Song of Solomon is replete with examples of people, of a couple enjoying physical int intimacy and love. And I don't think that was only written for 20 year olds. I think that we can make a case that that is for throughout the entire spectrum of marriage and that that if, you know, God put in the canon of scripture a whole book that celebrates married love and intimacy, that there is a, a wonderful gift there that, that we need to be um, pursuing, really. And I think the, for, for faith traditions that may teach um, that sex is only for Very procreation, that we could help people realize that, that that isn't truly what scripture teaches because there's a whole breadth of the marital relationship. And I think scripture sets beautiful boundaries for, as Sherry so beautifully mm -hmm. articulated with the Song of Solomon, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's sad from a woman's point of view, just my own, that say you finished your children in your 30s that mm -hmm. You wouldn't still have that relationship if it wasn't for just m making children. Right. I think that would be very sad. I think anatomically, too, God gave us so many ways to be pleasured in that area that it, I don't think you can make a case that it's only for procreation. You know, like, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. The, the context for marriage is really about growth, development, and unfoldment for the soul. 
is not necessarily about procreating and having children because there's seven and a half billion us, of us on the planet now. Right. And so people coming together are coming together for different reasons. And, and one of the reasons that people come together is to grow. And that is to unleash uh, the, 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 the creativeness and the gifts of one's soul. So when, when, when individuals come together and they have a, an attraction, they have a level of intimacy that's developed, over a long period of time, contempt can also develop because there are hurts, unforgivenesses, things that go unspoken, things that are misinterpreted, uh, misperceived. Uh, and so when, when that contempt sets into a relationship and the unforgiveness is there, then there's stuckness. Right. The intimacy is gone. What, what I would say to the menopausal women is that there's an overculture of puritanicalism that they may be under siege by. They want to break free from that and realize if they're still alive, it's not about retirement. It's about, as I heard recently, it's about refirement. If you're still alive, there's fire in you. There's love in you. There's kindness in you. There's compassion in you. And you do what you have to do to allow that refirement to take place. Retirement means to change your tires if you're still alive. It just means to change your tires. So it means take care of the body. Well, this is a time when women are really free. No periods. They don't have to be concerned about getting pregnant. Um, they're moving into a higher vibration. And we must language in a new manner where women experience liberation, where they know that they can come freely, whether they are self-pleasuring or whether they are uh, enjoying a wonderful, um, sensual mm, coming together with their husband or their loving partner. And they need to know that it's all right. Robert Sternberg has a model of love that I use almost every therapy session I do. He says, you need three things to have a really healthy marriage. You need to have commitment, so you work it out through the tough times. You need to have intimacy, which means you talk and you're close and you're unguarded with each other and you have a friendship. And you need passion. I always heard it taught that, you know, sex was just the icing on the cake. No way, it's the cake. And so it's very important to focus on those three things if you're going to have a happy marriage. And if you take one of those three things away, I guarantee you the relationship will suffer in the long run. And Pam, I honestly believe, because I have seen it, that your sexual health is completely connected to the rest of your physical health. And when you have good sexual functioning, it really helps you in other ways. I mean, we all already know it's connected to your cardiovascular system. You get more blood flow to your brain. It helps prevent against dementia. It helps your skin look younger. It helps decrease your blood pressure. It helps decrease stress. Obviously, it, if it's going well, it's gonna increase marital or relationship satisfaction. There's some, a study that came out a little while ago showing that you grow brain cells and that your cognitive functioning is better and that your eyesight may even be better. I mean, sex really involves the entire body. And to pretend like it belongs to this taboo realm over here, you really do a disservice to your health. I really encourage couples to understand that they nurture their aerobic soul. They go to the gym and they make time to go to yoga and meditate and they nurture their work soul where they check their 250 emails a day. And it's very important to prioritize their sexual soul right. and to maintain that intimacy. And, you know, it's really sometimes the basics. It's really about turning off the electronics and addressing the fatigue and, you know, using that lock on the master bedroom door when the kids are maybe on their way to college or teens or what have you, really to nurture that and prioritize it. So what I find is, for many women, um, you know, they're the cookers, the cleaners, they take care of their children, they work in the home, out of the home. And when it comes to their specific needs, whether it's their health or their vaginal health or their sexual health, they kind of let that fall 
to the bottom of the list. You know, the latest research says women do 87% of all chores. So the first thing when I get couples in for sex therapy, that is on my chore list. Okay, listen, we're gonna go over the chores because you know what? Mama can't do everything and have sex with you. And if the guy knows, if the husband knows, you know, because his buddies, he always says, Mary Jo, my buddies say that you're making me more like a woman, making me do all these chores. And I said, tell your buddies you're getting a lot more sex now than you <laughs> used to. And, and he kind of laughs, but he gets it. Right. Like, if you don't pull your weight with the things that need to be done, then, then she's not going to pull her weight in the bedroom because women are like elephants. They remember everything. It's really hard for us to let go of all of our responsibilities inside of the home. But when you remove us out of that element and put us in a hotel room, it's amazing. I call it ho hotel room horniness because it happens. It's what I recommend when everybody calls. It's one of the biggest things I, get, I, I have, get asked on the radio station is like, how do I spice up my sex life? And I send everybody to a hotel room. And then I have them call back and they said, oh my God, it worked. Like we had a night to ourselves. We were able to get a little bit naughty. And it, and it kind of holds you over for a while. It's simple things that can spice things up. And hotel rooms is number one on my list. You got to always work on the romance. Don't you uh, agree? The romance, the romantic things. Now, it's not instinctual for most men, though. We don't really know what it is. I'm from Philadelphia. You know what romance is in Philadelphia? What? Hey, relax, honey. There ain't no cars coming. <laughs> trying to work on the bra. They think that's, they think that's, I said to my friend, Bobby, go, you ever take your woman to a chick flick? He goes, of course I have. Not all girls are into porno though. <laughs> that's a true story. But you have to work on those things. Like my wife, I'll tell you what she did. I was working on this television show. and I was working 10 hours a day. I come home and there's a post-it note on the front door. And all the post-it note doesn't have my name. It just says, walk in, take your clothes off, Keep your mouth shut, get on the bed, and wait for your surprise. Uh-huh. She's got the candles going. By the way, little side note, sidebar, we don't care about candles. We'll be on a sewage dump with you if we want some action. But that's a sidebar that we don't need, really need. It. Race, race. So, so she takes me, so I get, I take my clothes off, I go into the bed, and it's all good. With the, you know, she gives me a massage. Everything's great. I go back to work the next day. I'm bragging everybody. She calls me. She goes, I said, honey. I'm bragging everybody about what you did. She goes, you idiot. You left the post-it note on the front door. <laughs> and the UPS guy's outside. <laughs> I said, I guess you got to see what Brown could do for you. <laughs> she didn't laugh like you just did. You got to keep the spark alive. <laughs> when your husband is getting enough sex, when he feels sexually satiated and, and connected with the, with the woman, that she's got everything right. she ever wanted. And if he feels grounded, if he feels anchored, if he feels like his woman wants him, I mean, there is no hoop that guy won't jump through. So women are always like, how'd you get your husband to be so good to you? And I'm like, I give him sex and I enjoy it. I want to. It's, it's our marriage. He's my team player. You know what I tell the men who come in my office? Get on the post-it note at the beginning of the day, okay? If I know you want to have sex tonight, I'm, my behavior is going to change. Yeah. It doesn't, maybe, it may not feel as spontaneous, but we'll prepare a little bit. It's everything because I also get insecure if I didn't shave. I'm like, no, I'm too hairy. I can't do it. And it's like, I feel like a real, you know, Debbie Downer sometimes, but if you're a team member, and that's where communication comes in. Yes. Of saying like, this is, and I did have that talk. I said, this is what it takes to make me feel really naughty and sexy. And if you can help me out, I promise I will work on my own insecurities. But that communication is everything. I, I would say most of my patients now do not enjoy sex. And, you know, many of my patients have struggled with body image since they were small. And this is many times what my counseling is. They'll be out to dinner and the woman is feeling kind of chubby or overweight and dowdy. And her, it's her date night. And her partner 
is every woman that comes in, he checks out with his eyes. Right. You know what? He's not getting laid He's that not night. It's not going to happen. Nothing. And nothing's going to happen. Right. She's going to be resentful. She's going to feel devalued. And she's going to feel that, that she is convinced that he doesn't desire her anymore. Right. We have to feel good about ourselves. Do women in their 90s still want sex? Do they? There's a lot of them still having yeah. intercourse. Do you still want sex? It's been so long. But do you want it? Like right now, if I could put you on your ideal guy, would you say, okay? Not the way my body looks. Really? That's a huge problem. I don't need real really? really? laughter. And as you age too, you get a little more insecure of your body in general. Oh my goodness. Now look at I'm talking to the most beautiful woman oh, no. in the world. Do you ever get insecure? I am absolutely insecure. I mean, ever since I gave birth, um, you know, I had a C-section. So the C-section scar along with stretch marks, there, I cannot have sex in the daylight or during the day unless there's blackout curtains and a, one candle that's lit in the left hand corner of the room, or I have to leave my bra on and... Do you know how many women you just helped saying that? You have no idea how many women feel the same way. They are, they are crying out there listening to you right now. The menopausal symptoms that I'm having are mood swings, irritability, depression, low sex drive. I don't like my body. You know, it is amazing the number of women that have not been unclothed in front of their companion for years. And so if we can help the psychological component of that, where I can walk around my bedroom unclothed during the day without embarrassment, and then with your help, with the vaginal creams, I think that's all part of the solution. Working to help them feel better about themselves, more confident about their, their bodies, communicating to their companions, I've been through this, I've been through that, work with me. I think it all ties together. Right, and it's okay for them to want to look great. It is absolutely fine. It is absolutely fine. It's not about the sex. It's about the, it's about love making and being with someone and being intimate and, and, and tender and all those moments. That's what's going to keep you going in a relationship. I was working in a cancer hospital and I got uh, paged once by a young woman who was terminal and she was dying. And um, she said, Dr. Critchman, please write an order on the chart that my husband can get in bed with me. And she knew she was going to pass away. And she knew that it wasn't about intercourse. It was about that human connection and spirit. So I think it's important to recognize that sex is not only a physical act. It's an emotional, spiritual connection that can enhance a couple's togetherness. It can enhance the connection, the union. Um, it's a good way to say hello, and sometimes it's also a good way to say goodbye in this mm -hmm. case. And I think it's very important to remember that, you know, there's no age limit on that kind of human experience. There's lots of ways to just sort of regenerate uh, an energy, a sexual energy. It doesn't have to be uh, in a prone position, naked on the bed. Yeah. It's, it's an all day romance. It's okay at this age, it's okay forever to be intimate and, and uh, to understand love. It's okay, you already did it once, you know how to do it. Right. We don't have to re teach you anything, it's just a matter of doing it, you know. Just, that all comes with the attitude. You know, and the tides need to turn. We go out into public now and we see young people and we are always thinking, oh goodness, get a room. But I want young people <laughs> to look to at, <laughs> at 50 pluses and go, oh my gosh, would you two get a room? Yeah. I want them to see yeah, we get that. that. I like that. Well, because he can't keep his hands off me, you know. <laughs> Everywhere we go, he gives and me And that's a... okay. It's mind. okay. Well, I'm not stopping, so I'm glad it's there okay. You Thank you, Pam. <laughs> I worked with a veteran from the Iraq War, and he was, he was, it was terrible. The IEDs that were explosive during the Iraq, and he got his penis and one whole leg removed. And for, he almost didn't live, but he came back. His what he had a wife and he had a small child, and I got referred them, 
And when they came in together, she cried almost the whole session. He looked like he looked like he had been humiliated beyond anything. And he said, "We are here for sex therapy, but I have nothing that can have sex." And I said, "Oh, but you do. You have your eyes, you have your mouth, you have your tongue, you have your hands. You have a woman who loves you, and I think you're smarter than that." You're gonna have to think out of the box. They come back now, and he's like, "That is the best thing that ever happened to me." I'm like, "No, you don't mean it. That, because really, that's a terrible thing." But he said, "I have finally learned how to love my wife." Oh, that's so beautiful. Sex is not just penetration. Please understand that sex is kissing, sex is touching, oral sex, manual stimulation. You know. What if you just want to dance for your partner, or tell them an erotic story in their ear, or what if you guys are on a trip and you want to talk to each other on the phone, or even anticipating going on a date? Sex is so much; it's not just penetration. So, what's happening, especially in menopause, because women find it so, so much more difficult to function, that they take everything off the table. What's going on? They sh they need, like you said, permission, permission to say, hey, you know what? It's okay for me to be sexual, and even if we're not having penetration this week, we could still be maybe kissing. We could still be reaching orgasm other ways. I think it's a matter of understanding, you know, what is it that you want from sex? How much do you include in your sexual repertoire? Right? If sex is only one way, and you can no longer do it that way, then you don't have many options. But if you have eight different things on the menu, right? You have seven other things to choose from, and so I, I tell people, listen, it's not over just because you have menopause. Absolutely not. Men think it, women think it, because nobody's talking about it. They think that's it, menopause, and my sex life is going to be over. Absolutely not. That's what we're here to tell them about. We're going to make it better. We are. We're going to hopefully we are going to give women and men information that makes. Their relationship better, sex better, non-penetrative sex better. Their whole relationship and their whole intimate life right, better as they get older. Many would see it as the beginning of the end, and I would see it as the beginning of a period of reawakening. And I think it's important for those who are. Living with and sharing the life of a woman who's going through menopause to understand it, to understand that it is normal to have some mood swings, to understand that there will be some days of melancholy, to understand that there will be some times where intimacy is not necessarily needed. So, despite、uh, all the optimism that I have for women in this time period, I'm here to say that it's not always easy,、mm -hmm. and for those women. I offer them a talisman, a lucky charm to help them get through it, and it is these three things: pray, work, relax. Pray. What do I mean? Get up and pray to the gods you worship. Seek inspiration. Seek guidance. Now that you've got the guidance, now that you've got the marching orders, get up and do something. No sulking. Get up. One foot in front of the other. Get up and do something. There are plenty of people. That need your help and your wisdom and your insights. These women are all over the world, and they have had baffling and bewildering things happen to them. And they are leading our civic organizations, our art museums, and they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, leading. Even though they have tough things in their life, they're leading with enthusiasm, and it's inspiring to watch them. And then finally, relax. It's the end of a long day. You said your prayers, Pam. You've done. Your work, you've helped other people, you've been involved, and you're still frustrated. Well, that's about all you can do in life. You've prayed and you've worked, but but try to relax, because that's that's all that you can really do. I've traveled more than twenty thousand miles on this incredible journey. I did this for my patients, and I did this for myself. I am so glad to hear that doctors all across the country. Are starting to find out the exact same things that I have. This really gives me the courage, the strength, and the drive to keep going. 
to fight for my patients and all the women because this time of our lives, menopause should be one of the best. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time to be able to share with women and men regarding who we are and that these temples are alive. It's about life. It's about living. It's about loving life. And it's about living and loving who we be. Because if we be not, then no thing would exist. So, you know, I'm just saying. Well, it's you that are putting it on the forefront. So thank you. Really, you're, you've helped so many women, and this is going to help so many of them, you know, be comfortable talking about it now. And I learned so much because I value my vagina, and I want a beautiful, young, healthy one forever. So thank you for helping me with you're that. You're welcome. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Do you want to see it? Just kidding. <laughs> we have got to protect the menopausal vaginas of America. And I want to get the of A's. <laughs> well, I'm on board. <laughs> I'm not going to stop teaching, learning, and getting this information out to everyone I know. People need to know. Women, men, their daughters and sons. My dream is to start a movement. Let's call it the menopause romance revolution. Hey, I can dream big, right? I may be just one voice, but hopefully everyone will start to recognize that now is the time. Let's start the revolution today. This is our first generation of knowledge and we need to share it. So charming, you're so lovely. Thank you so much. How long are you in New York for? Oh, lady, 